you so much. 27th of October, and we are pleased that Kyle Mills has come back to join us. Now, as I understand it, the book that you came and signed for us last year had been partially written by these. Is that right? Two and a half pages. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I thought, it, do you need this one? I think I, knew, I, I, think I just had it turned on. Oh, okay. So I thought it was more substantial than that. It was barely uh, a sketch, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's when I signed on, it was that, uh, you know, he had these two and a half pages, and I thought that many had a whole outline and all these ideas, and I said, well, have, said, have Lisa send me the box of stuff, and he said, what box? There, there's no box. So that's what I had since two and a half pages. Wow. You know, the whole thing caught everybody by so much surprise, and he worked so, he, he babbled that so hard. And I think at the end, it was such a rush that, that it just didn't happen. Yeah. But how brave of him to have even done so. I can't believe it. I, it would certainly have been the last thing on my mind, uh, for sure. He was truly dedicated to it. Vince was here for all of his books, and I can still remember, you know, he self-published his first book. And I still remember standing in the back room of the older Poison Pen and Vince, you know, making a pitch to me about his book. And he said to me, I'm going to work harder than anyone. I'm going to be successful, and you're going to be glad that, you know, you've taken a chance on me. I would have anyway. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, and he really did make that make that happen. Um, yeah, it's kind of amazing. The guy was a, a force of nature. Yeah. I mean, he he decided, well, I'm going to go and sit in this old house and I'm going to write this book, and uh, I'm going to be a huge best-selling author, which probably a lot of people say, but nobody actually does. And he did it. Um, I wrote my first book for fun and thought my mom would read it. So <laughs> it was really shocked me that it ever got published. And the fact that they gave me a two book deal was a little startling because I'd never really planned to write a second book. Did your mom actually read it? She did. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I'd be able to put it in the attic and never think about it again. Uh, it's, been, it's been interesting. Um, so you, while you did have you know, all of the earlier books, more or less than the, the last, I'm sorry, it's called Survivor, right? I was having a senior moment. Well, the Survivor is the prior one. That's the what I first mean. one that I Right, yeah, but um, so Survivor was actually more your book than I thought. Yeah, yeah. It, though it carried over a storyline, so Vince liked to arc his stories over multiple books, and definitely The Last Man, which was the last book he wrote, didn't finish. It was clearly intended to go on. Right. Unfortunately, he killed the bad guy, which made my life really, really difficult. <laughs> I guess it was hard to resurrect him without venturing into a different genre. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I had videos of him. Like, he made these videos because I thought he can't just be dead. Speaking of which, I just read the Dear Patricia Cornwall. Are any of you Patricia Cornwall readers? Do you know that she, you know, she had the serial killer, and then he showed up again, and then after that, his ghost showed up. My God, he's back in the story. Yeah, is he alive? <laughs> no, it's together? DNA. She has, a, she has not ventured into our, But I, I thought, you know, let's find a new guy. I'm just, I'm just done with him. I don't want to read about it. So you had to create somebody new in the absence of the dead bad guy. So I just pulled a, I pulled one of the characters that was this very minor character uh, that worked uh, for Pakistani intelligence and who was very mild-mannered and played as being very incompetent, and I thought, well, maybe he's just hiding, sort of like Irene Kennedy does, that, that he's really competent, but he's, he's really in the background. So I turned him into the antagonist, and then created videos of the other guy that were kind of taunting Mitch, because he said, basically, if you're watching these videos, I know you killed me, but it's not going to stop what, I, what I'm doing. So, when you got to the end of The Survivor, are you at the end of that story arc, or is it yes. going on into the super? No, I'm not much for arcing stories that hard. Uh, I, I mean, it, you, the, Vince, the Vince Flynn series, or the Mitch Rapp series, uh, is one long story in my mind. I can't even really break it up. If you ask me what happened in one book or the other, to me it starts when he was in college, and now he's about 44. So. My, that arc kind of continues, you know, if somebody gets injured in one book, then they are at the beginning of the next book or something like that. But as far as storylines, hard storylines not finishing, I don't feel like I'm very good at that, and I don't want to do something I'm not good at. I think most of these ensembles, I mean, there, there are a number of people, Brad Taylor, um, James Brown, oh, by the way, I confirmed Jim Rollins today, December 13th. 
will be the new Sigma Force Club. Yay. And we're going to give it a Christmas party, either at the Goldmore or the Hilton, because I think it'll be fun. But, you know, there are always people in the in the group, you know, that come forward, some of them take the spotlight or they're personalized or whatever, and Vince didn't have quite that ensemble, but nonetheless, you know, he did have characters that walked along with Mitch. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, they're great. It, though It's funny, he would sometimes seem to forget them. And I... I yeah, I, I felt the same way that all the fans do. Now they call me and say, well, what, are you going to resurrect Greta? What happened to Greta? What happened to Donatella? What happened to, you know? And so I, it's really fun because I always wondered too. So now I'm bringing them all back. <laughs> find out what happened to all those people. It's Fine. a resurrection book after Or a column. <laughs> or a column. One or the other. Right. Yeah, that's right. It's sort of fun to be God of the universe, right? Master of the universe. <laughs> And one you followed for so long, you know? Uh, so, yeah, I, I killed a few at the beginning, but I didn't either, well, one was two, one got a little old, and one I didn't really understand, uh, his relationship with Mitch, so I thought, I'll just kill him. And not worry about it, because I thought about it forever. What am I going to do with this guy? And I thought, I can solve this problem. And got him, got him both killed, but all in one page, I think. Um, yeah, so, uh, but the others uh, are uh, that have been fascinating me forever. I'm, I'm slowly kind of bringing back so we can figure out uh, what ha whatever happened to them. So you went into this with the expectation it was a long-term commitment. Well, I signed a three-book deal. So okay. and, and publishing, that's a long-term commitment. Which is the but... longest one I've <laughs> ever signed. Usually the, the thing about being an author is you're unemployed at the end of every year. You know, you, you, my wife sits there and says, what sees me sulking around in my jammies. She's like, oh, you finished your book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, the three book deal kind of freaked me out, honestly. I thought, man, I'm going to be old by the time I finish that thing. Um, but yeah, so I, I kind of planned out where it was going to go a little bit. And I'm in a very good mood tonight because a half an hour ago I finished the first draft of the next one. Bravo! Wow! Round of applause! Always my favorite. I thought you don't kind of care about it. I thought maybe it was just the Arizona thing with the flip flops and, and all that. I'm from Wyoming. I'm so hot. <laughs> <laughs> I have shoes. I brought them, but I couldn't put them. <laughs> I was thinking how chilly it was. I ran right out here. And then, well, the good news is the Cubs are now playing until tomorrow night. And yes. Yeah, the election itself. Sorry, guys, but I grew up in Wrigley Field, so. I'm really into this whole yeah, yeah, yeah. into this whole thing. I want them to win four, among other reasons I don't want them to be playing for the pen at opposite Michael Conley a week from Tuesday. <laughs> 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 I was got hard part time explaining to Michael why it was an empty <laughs> game. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, watching the Cubs, you know, but we'll see. I, I like to feel there's a note of hope in an otherwise sort of dismal fall that, you know, and actually to be fair, even if Cleveland wins, it's also a note of hope because they're almost as far away from it all as the Cubs. But anyway, so tell us about, about the new book as much as you feel that we should know. Uh, well, it's kind of a continu what certainly is a continuation of uh, from the next one, but not not a bad exact story arc. And this one sort of brings in uh, Russia and ISIS, which it's kind of interesting to think that uh, Vince didn't really know anything about ISIS, and he didn't r really see the uh, rise of Putin back on the world stage. So, the the first book was, I, I hate to use this word, but I use it all the time, I, the goal was to create a forgery. I, I didn't want anybody to know what uh, what pages I wrote and the very small number of pages he wrote. I wanted it to seem really seamless, particularly because I was finishing Vince's thought. This one, though, I had to move forward with a little bit. Uh, can't, it's thrillers obviously can't stay static. They have to follow what's going on, and the, the characters have to continue their arc and their growth. So this one relates to all the turmoil in uh, Russia that's being caused by low oil prices. Um, they're an interesting country in that they don't, uh, people think they're a resurgent in a way, but in, in fact they're kind of cratering and it's making them more dangerous. Putin has to try to hold on to power in a country that is just not getting anywhere, and it's in fact going backward to some extent. So he keeps causing trouble and kind of 
pump up. He's using his extraction techniques, exactly. which is really yeah. what Hitler did in the early 1930s in Germany. Was in such terrible shape that he started all this, you know, yeah. distracting. A lot people. of parades and military right. equipment, and everybody gets fired up. And so he's trying to uh, to kind of get control of his country and keep control of it because once he loses that, uh, the oligarchs will kill him. So. Now Mitch has to, I'm kind of pitching him against the, the Russians, which he's never really done before, and that's sort of the, one of the, it's one of the most fun things about writing this book, is to give Mitch some challenges that he hasn't had in the past and see how he reacts. Because he feels very real to me after reading all the books and studying all the books and, and then writing a couple. So it's fun to see that, and in, in this one I pit him against uh, an opponent that's basically as good as he is which he hasn't really run into either, so he has to kind of go into it thinking, you know, my knee's sort of shot, I don't see as well as I used to. <laughs> I'm a little old, this guy is 10 years younger than me, I might not come out of this. And it's, it's so, and then in relationships, trying to get him back into a relationship and stuff, so just see how he reacts to these things, which is fun. Yeah, that's a really good point. If you're going to write the thriller, tracking real events as close as you can, although obviously they can change before your book gets published from the time that you read it. Um, he's bound to get older, and as he gets older, you have to ask yourself, can he really do the stuff in his 40s that he could do in his 20s? Not everybody can, unless you have accumulated stress and injury. injuries. Yes, yes, right. injuries. So at some point, you know, when you're thinking, I mean, it's interesting what Daniel Silva is doing with Gabriel because he's sort of moving him towards a desk job because Gabriel is getting older and now he's the father and he has twins. And that's another question is how much risk can you take for yourself if you suddenly, you know, have kids as opposed to, you know, it's only you and if you die, that would be sad, but nobody's gonna suffer. But, and so inevitably almost, Gabriel's moving, and there's a new guy who's gonna be kind of, I can't think of his name, but you've all seen him, the same thing. British, Irish, whatever it is, it's going to kind of be moving in there. And I thought, you know, that was a realistic approach to this whole issue. Yeah, and, and Mitch is always, I just had a huge <coughs> fight with him, like, arguing in a bar with his brother about his brother as to how old Mitch was. I thought was. Mitch's brother, and I know it's that. Thank you, Realism, too. Until his wife said, oh, for God's sake, you bigger just like you did with Vince, stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but uh, I, I think he's 44. So uh, you get to this. I get to this. <laughs> and uh, so he's got he's got some life left in him yet. But it also I I kind of want him to get into you know he got really dark there for a while and he had a pretty hard life and I wanted to, would like to get him into a relationship again. But that's hard too because you know what do you do with the wife? It's it's, uh, you know, he had one book where she was off visiting her mother. And that was the only mention that she had called her once or something. And then, you know, we were all so happy that she had to us. At least I was. I thought, what am I going to do with her? But apparently Vince was really happy with that happened too. Because so John Sanford has talked, I don't know how many times, he gave Lucas a wife. And children, and he has told me more than once that he dreams of putting them in an airplane and blowing them off so he can take Lucas back to being Lucas before he became husband, father, and the whole thing. So instead he, cre instead he created Virgil, which works out just as well. But, you know, but it was really touch and go there for Heather and the weather and the kids for a little while. And it is the problem if you have an action hero. How much of family can they really have? And he's always off in the Interlands, and uh, you know, his wife was very sort of idealistic, and I thought she kind of rode him too hard, personally. Um, <laughs> so, and then many had gone to tell her that she was re always ready to, you know, kill him. So yeah, you're you're always afraid she's going to get paid some money and take him out. So yeah, I'm trying to find some a woman in the Goldilocks zone there. You know, not too good, not too psycho, you know, just right in the middle. Maybe you're already attached to someone so she can't become too attached to Mitch. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's a really interesting point, though, about the fact that not only was Putin's Russia quieter, um, but ISIS was not 
as big and, you know, was indifferent anyway than it is at the moment. But with all that's going on in the Middle East right now, and, you know, there's for the Sunni are weighing in, and we're, you know, do you have to study up on all that to write your next book if you're going to try to be realistic about world events? I definitely do try to keep up with all that stuff. Uh, though, it's almost getting to where it's so complicated that yeah, it's not that fun. I, e even Vince, you know, really, I don't know that Sunni and Shia were words that were ever used in this entire series because once you start getting into that complexity, uh, things can be bogged down pretty quickly in this kind of thriller. So I know all us thriller writers are thinking we're all rooting for Putin because if, if we could just get Russia back as a threat, it would it, it, it'd be like being back in the Cold War again and be great. <laughs> unless, <laughs> yeah, well, unless, unless, yeah, unless you use one of those. Well, it's, it's, it's a simpler, you know, it's a simpler target. Is, well, is what you're saying? And, you know, and it's, it's more com in a way. It's also more complex in that they have the resources to <clears throat> for all these grand plans, whereas right. the uh, the Muslim threats. So you're kind of discounting China as an immediate threat? For now, you know, the thing is that that's a lot of nautical stuff, and I just don't see Mitch on the boat, I don't know, for some reason. So, yeah, I'm, I'm probably not going to go there. I wrote a book not that long ago about that uh, for the Ludlums. So it, uh, I might just let that sit for a while. I feel like the history, the history with Mitch is that he's a really specialist. He speaks the language. He looks... Arab. But to some extent, the same thing is going on in China with the current guy is that China's economy is shaky and things are going, um, they're, they're now experiencing the Rust Belt. I was reading about it, um, you know, when our Midwest gradually everything moved overseas and now we have the mess that has created the Republican Party at the moment. Um, Apparently in China, they, they wrote a big thing in the Wall Street Journal about some big city where all this manufacturing was going on and all these, and now it's all going away. It's going somewhere cheaper. It's going to Indonesia. It's going, and now they're suffering the same sort of exodus of manufacturing jobs and so forth that we have saved to distract them. You know, he too is doing, you know, communist loyalty and yeah. corruption building investigations islands. and yeah. building islands and how much of that is real and how much of that is simply a distraction for the populace. Well, a, that's a super interesting situation. It's happened, well, like everything, it's happened before in history. In, in, uh, I always think of, of South Africa, which if their mining was killing us because they essentially had slave labor. And then we started inventing all kinds of great mining machines. And then suddenly we could mine cheaper than they could with their right. slave labor. And then the whole bottom fell out of it. And I think they're in the same situation. Not only is it going to be moved into Indonesia and places like that, but it's, everything's automated. Technology. Yeah, so amazing. some days, you know, machines are going to put together those iPhones, and then nobody's going to have a job. Well, that would be great. What, what people then do? I mean, it's going to be a more a, a global problem. Well, it's an interesting thing because nobody talks about that. You know, you hear the, the politicians talking now about, you know, the Mexicans are taking jobs or, or the Chinese are taking jobs. When in fact, it's, it's really automation is, is the big problem. I mean, you know, the number one uh, employment for men in the United States is driving. And in the next 10 years, you can see that completely go away. So what do you do? I don't know. You, I mean, well, you, you uh, with driverless cars. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, maybe you could have started some wars and parades and keep everybody's mind off it, I guess. That's a really sinister point. <laughs> <laughs> I do that for a little. Well, I mean, I, I, I do think, you know, I mean, what do you do with people, you know, who make their living mining coal, or, you know, what do you do with West Virginia at this point? Well, like my state of Wyoming, it's like an exodus. Some people are escaping it like grass from the sinking ship. Mm -hmm. Well, having just on through the whole Northwest Passage on the Crystal Cruise, and all I can tell you, and I've said this before, a thousand people got on that ship, many of whom didn't think global warming was anything but, you know, a democratic cabal or scientists running amok, and at the end they took a poll, and 100% of the 1,000 people all went, okay, it's real, you know, I mean, you could see it, I mean, it was just right there in front of you, there's no ice, you know, the, the seals are trying to figure out where to live, the polar bears, are they going to adapt? Um, the whole native way of life, they're all trying to, you know. Can we talk about the book? 
I never had, uh, so here's a funny thing, we sure. won't talk about that, but, but, the, uh, but right this is funny, I, I, I just finally put, uh, after 20 years, I put furniture on my north-facing yeah. deck. It was, it's, so if you live in Wyoming, it's lovely. Great. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the book? Uh, I don't know. Does anybody have any questions? That's a great idea. Yeah, I do. Huh? Is it difficult, was it difficult for you to separate your own books from the Flynn, the Vince Flynn books in terms of writing them? Was that a difficult transition? My writing about such a type A hero type guy? Uh, yeah, well, yes and no. Uh, the, it was kind of funny that I got this job, really, because I don't really write anything. My books aren't really anything like Vince's, and I, I have a terrible interviewer. I, they asked me what I do with it, and I said, well, here's some ideas, but I'm not going to do any of that. I'll just <laughs> my job. And I told my wife, I definitely did not get that job. Um, but I did, and it helped, because if I start slipping into my own voice, then it's really apparent. And I generally don't, it's funny, a, a couple of weeks ago I wrote the worst chapter I've ever written in my life. And one of my rules is never go back. You know, always push forward, finish the book, and then you can go back. And this one is just keeping me awake at night. But I had I, I, I made Mitch really wishy-washy in a situation. And with, so there's very much one of my characters would be like, ah, I don't want to fight about it, you know, I'm going to trick the guy into doing what I want to do. And it was just terrible. And I, I laid awake all night, and the next morning I thought, I can't let this stand. I <laughs> so I deleted the whole thing. And redid. <laughs> so, it, so the answer is, actually, it turned out to be better uh, for me. And I think if I was, you know, somebody like a Brad Thor or something, that it would be very easy to write my own book about Mitch Rapp, which is not what I wanted to do, and I don't think it should ever be done. Yes, sir? Um, in, in what you mentioned Brad Thor with his uh, Scar <coughs> Harbath character, he's mentioned I mean, Vince Flynn has mentioned the Scott Harbath character in his books before. Do you and Brad Thor have any any plans to bring these two together? Somebody told me that Brad had talked about uh, doing something like doing a short story or something with the two of them in it. And actually, I haven't talked to Brad in like a year. So, uh, I don't know. It would be fun to do something like that, like do a short story and maybe just give the proceeds to uh, military charity or something like that. No, but one of these so, days, I don't know. Thriller writers have done that, you know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And they're now doing one, um, the one coming up is a man and a woman as compared to two guys. Yeah, so well, it's like Stanford and Beaver oh, oh, story okay. together, but this time it's going to be Steve Barry and Diana Gallagher. How's that for a Oh, wow. Right. <laughs> and that will be, <laughs> I know, all happen right here. <coughs> uh, but that will be, um, so possibly you and Brad, you know, they, they use these for fundraising, so maybe yeah. you and Brad could come up with something. It would it would be fun to do. I'm sure the family would be into it if, uh, you know, the proceeds went to, went to charity and stuff. It's just one of those things that... Uh, Finding the time with all the deadlines and everything, and uh, yeah. catching up. He actually told me he was going to be in Jackson Hole, where I live, uh, maybe this fall. So I may run into him. Anybody else? So have you ever met Vince Flynn? And how did you, like you said, when you went to the interview, how did you, how did that process go? I guess was it thrown uh, out there into the so world no. and said, "Hey, we need somebody to take over Vince," or? Uh, the No, actually, I never did. We were supposed to get together years ago and with Brad Thor, actually, and Brad Meltzer, and we could never figure out how to do it. We were going to go to Park City and go skiing uh, and kind of let that go, thinking, well, we'll do it at some point, which is probably a life lesson there. Um, the As far as... Uh, the interview went, I, I was really surprised, honestly, to get the call. I, my wife had called me when Vince died. She said, oh my god, I just heard Vince had died. We had thought he was you know, getting better. Um, but my assumption was this would have all been taken care of you know, well ahead of time. And so it, it, I, my hope was that it was taken care of and that they had decided as a fan that they would continue forward and that they'd gotten somebody good. <laughs> so uh, then they, when I got the call, it was uh, a bit of a surprise. So. I, don't, I asked his his, uh, his agent, because people ask me that a lot, why they picked me, and it was because I had done some stuff for Love uh, and had written in a lot of different styles. So I've written books that are, you know, first person kind of general fiction, I've written more military thrillers, scientific stuff, I, I kind of, whatever gets in my head uh, at any given time, and I didn't write a lot of series characters, because 
there's always some new shiny object to write about. So you might want to explain that you're actually working for the Flynn estate. Yeah, yeah. So I thought it was clear. His, yeah, family, owns, for his family owns the literary rights, and yeah. they have the ability to hire. Um, that's what's going on with the <laughs> <family. laughs> that's what's going on with the Robert Parker estate and the Ludlow estate and so forth is that the, the heirs, people that inherit that, are then able to hire people if they want to. And a lot of a lot of people families don't want to. The author dies and you know, that's it. Um, but some some do. So yes sir. How much control does the family have over what you write? Uh, I mean, I guess they could exert control if they wanted to, uh, but uh, they never have tried. And there was the, with the first book, they Lisa, uh, his, his wife, didn't like the fact that uh, at the beginning she mentioned that he was drinking and smoking in that, and uh, but I was going somewhere with that. So I, I told her, don't, don't worry, there's there's a whole sort of getting his life back together aspect to this. So, uh, but that was that's really the only comment. The Nazi's editor has lots of comments. <laughs> <laughs> when you write, whether it's for Ludlum or you know now, is it hard to put your ego aside as a, a, a writer that is creative, you know, and to to kind of suppress that part, or can you take get your you know can you get creativity? Um, I I mean I have complete creative control over mm -hmm. it, so I mean I. There would certainly be things that you know, I probably wouldn't want to do, and it wouldn't be accepted, but I would never do those anyway. So um, it isn't really a huge problem for me. It's probably one of the reasons that I've been able to do this, is I wouldn't say I wrap a huge amount of my ego up in being sort of the famous writer. I like writing books, and to me, the challenge of it, the fun of it, is what I'm, that, that's really what I'm after, much less the... I mean, it's nice to sell a million books and everything, but that, that wouldn't be the, the forefront you know, forefront of my mind when I'm working on it. So do you think that writing three books in this way will change your own writing <coughs> style? Yeah, I've learned a lot about this. You know, it's funny when you take on a job like this, and probably just speaking to ego, you have to really, so I went through, I read all of Vince's books again. I had read them just as a fan, but over you know many, many years. Um, you, you sit there and you think, well, what did Vince do well, and what did he maybe not do as well? And then you have to kind of get a stiff drink and think the same thing about you. You know, what, what do I do well, and what can I bring to this? And what maybe should I avoid, because uh, I'm not that good at it. And so if you can kind of put that together, I think that's a really important component to uh, being able to create a book like this, because you want to bring your strengths to it, but you have to stay within the framework definitely of what's been done before because, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And, you know, Vince, Vince's books didn't fix it. <coughs> oh, wait. Oh, sorry. We're both, we're both, we're both, we're both I'm going to I'm gonna let you, uh, you, you no, be the no, master no, no. of ceremony. No, so no. Can't be both. All right, well done. I was curious, uh, how did you react to the way that the Vince Flynn uh, fan received your book? It's been great. Uh, you know, I was really worried when I signed on because this could have definitely gone two ways. You know, I could have gotten a thousand hate emails. <laughs> you know, I, I was really worried about that. So the question was, did people want to see the character continue on? And they did. So yeah, there was just a huge outpouring. You know, people were rooting for me, and that was, that's what I needed. You know, I, it would have been very, very hard to have written The Survivor getting 15 hate now. Um, and then because everybody was really fired up about the about it continuing, everybody gave it a chance. And I've had almost nothing. I mean, every once in a while I'll get a real zinger. But uh, for the most part, uh, people have really liked it. And I think because my main goal was to make it so you couldn't really tell the difference. So How many of you here have read The Survivor? Not all of you. Okay, so are you curious about, yeah. I mean, we've talked to each other before, so I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but no. did you come to see if, in fact, you wanted to read this? Uh, yeah, one of the other things I wanted to ask was, and I've asked this of Vince Flynn and Brad Thor and Taylor, you know, you write a book, it takes this many months to write this book. I read a book in 
less than a week. And I got to wait a whole year. <laughs> I mean, it's hard. <laughs> it's funny too because people will say that they, they, it used to drive Tom Clancy crazy. People would say, I, read that, I stayed up all night and read your book in one night. It took me two years. <laughs> but I always take it as a huge compliment that, that everybody's looking forward to the next one. So, and if you push them too fast, what will happen is it won't be as good a book. So you're kind of doing yourself in. You know, well, I, with Kyle, you know, once I found out that he was going to continue the Vince Flynn. Uh, characters and things. I had to get his one of his first books and read it to see. Oh, what kind of a writer is this guy? You know? But not necessarily like Vince. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you know, I mean, it was a completely different book. Yeah. But it was, you know, I liked it. it was I thought it was well written. You know, the characters were interesting. So I actually put on my website sort of because people kept asking me, and I I, I put a list in. The most Flynnish to the least Flynnish. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's terrible. People bring up like a book like Smokescreen, which is a first-person, like general fiction novel about the tobacco industry, and they go, "What have they done? Uh, how could they pick this guy?" So I didn't want everybody emailing me freaking out. So okay. in the glasses over here. Uh, yes. So I enjoyed the uh, Survivor. and Looking forward to the new book. Are you involved at all when Vince was here? One time, he talked a lot about turning Mitch Rapp into the big screen. Are you involved in that at all? Oh, no. Uh, no. Better to let Hollywood do what Hollywood does. Uh, and, you know, it, so they're making uh, American Assassin now. I don't know if everybody knows the first. Yeah, and Lisa was actually just there uh, in London watching the filming of uh, the beginning of it. So Who oh, is playing Mitch? Dylan O'Brien. Yeah. And... Uh, Michael Sheen from Tom Cruise. So I yeah. gotta try to recover. Hey, Dylan looks great. Good. They, yeah, you know, I've seen pictures of him with the beard and the gun and everything. And he's, every, some people send me emails saying, "Well, he's way too young, but he's actually a year older than Mitch would have been in that book." So people think of Mitch being forty in his forties, but not in that book. Yeah. So I think it's gonna be great. Michael Keaton, Stan Hurley, which I think is gonna be a great. I don't know who was <laughs> So, you, but, but she is cast, and I think she's going to be really good at. It. Yeah, she's different. She's African American, uh, but I think has the right look, and I, I think she's going to be really good. But she's not the director in that movie. Remember, she's younger too. So they're going to be doing movies and not serial television. Yeah, this will be. This is a major movie, and we'll see what goes on after that. It's funny, though, because that prequel, yeah, there's only one more, a kill shot, when he's young. So, they don't they don't have much to work with there. Uh, well, CBS bought that. Unless, yeah, they said no. Them, correct? I, know, hmm? I believe CBS Films has consent to kill, because I think that that was what was originally before American Assassin was ever even written. I think that that was the big... That was what they were going to start with, if I remember from... It'd be kind of hard to do now, though, because yeah. you know now now people the movie people are going to be thinking of Mitch as being twenty three or twenty four, um, and then the storyline is completely different because they didn't want to do a period piece. You know, it would have been that would have been the eighties, so uh, it's going to be more updated. So the story is, is generally along the same lines, but not the same. John, did you have a question? Well, um, I know you're right now. You're committed to um, uh, the, the Mitch Rapp books. But um, I think one of my favorite damaged but likable characters is Mark Demon. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if at any point in time you've considered bringing him back. I would like to. Uh, so as a character, the only series character I really ever wrote was this FBI agent. He's kind of the anti Mitch Rapp. He's fat, <laughs> and smokes too much, and he's a drunk. He's really surly. Um, and I love that character, and I, he was really fun to write because he's just so awful. And, but we'll see. You know, I, I, it would be really, it would be fun. I have a few characters that I've written about in the past uh, that would be really fun to bring back, and it's just a matter of how much time I have and whether I continue with this series or, or not. I wish I could write faster. I have all these ideas for my own books, but I can just I skid in right under the line with, with the, the track. So you have a contract for three books. Mm -hmm. Do you renew it after 
midway through, or does he die? He doesn't or, 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 well, he's not going to die. I'm sorry, what? He doesn't renew it. No, I don't. I don't. Well, um, he's not going to die. No. Uh, the, I think there's still a lot for him to do. He's still not dying. He's six years younger than me. <laughs> 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 Um, so yeah, it, it, whether I continue it or not is just going to be a question of everybody getting together and seeing what the fan reaction has been, seeing you know what the family wants to do and, and the publishers and all that. Um, and the service. And the service. Right. Yeah. See, yeah. See, yeah. See, yeah. I don't know. I think he sells himself. I mean, Mitch Rapp. Everybody knows him. And, you know, yeah. as long as you continue on in some sort of the same fashion, where he's not getting lazy and. You know, you can. It's a page turner because you're right. We read them in a couple of days because we need to know what happens. Yeah. So if you continue on that, I think the this is where fans get to vote. Buying a book is a vote. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, I mean, seriously, yeah, that's that's really absolutely. what it comes down to. You know, um, you get to play a, a part in it. Yeah. So hopefully it will build it because it's fun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you began writing this last book, you said this was, were there any talks? I tried to sell it <clears throat> for this book, yeah, because I wanted to know what happened there. Yeah, I mean, I I keep pounding on it for that thing, and I I feel like maybe with the movie coming out, there will be more demand for Mitch being younger again. So I'm hoping to find out what happened to all those people, particularly Greta, because he never mentioned her ever again, and I'm like, you know, what happened? So, uh, and then, you know, back then, Stan Hurley and he still hated each other. I mean, there was just all kinds of stuff to deal with, and it was supposed to be a trilogy. Um, and I'm actually not sure why Vince didn't just finish it, and he went on to, to move back. So, but, yeah, I would love to. I would love he to. He probably that. thought he had more time. Well, you know, yeah. To be. It just seems like you start, you start that, tri the, like, a trilogy of the young Mitch Rapp. It seems like he'd want to finish it. But maybe just, uh, well, he had a good idea for the last man to come up with his head. Yeah, so my father was an FBI agent for 25 years and he's the director of Interpol and the uh, legal agent in the United Kingdom. So, so FBI agent for 25 years, the director of Interpol and the legal agent in the United Kingdom, which is a fancy way of saying he ran the FBI's operation in England and around. Yeah, that might have been it. So actually, Mitch and I have uh, a little bit of shared history in that Pan Am 103 went down when I was having my uh, graduation, college graduation dinner in London with my parents, and my father's assistant came in and said, you know, a plane went down in the town in Scotland, and we think it just might have just gone down, but it could have been something else, and that was the last I saw of them for three months or something, he moved to Lockerbie. Um, so yeah, that was kind of my background. I've known that all those people and kind of grown up with them and uh, heard all their stories and stuff. And my father was, you know, being an FBI agent back then was really fun. You know, he's been attacked by monkeys and thrown out of seven-story windows and just, I mean, just a million weird things happened to people back then. Uh, it's a little more cerebral now, I think. But, uh, so I had all those characters and all those stories kind of in my mind, and then I had all those contacts too, which like, or like I said, I, I got into writing in a kind of a random way, and that's really why I got into thriller writing, because I liked all kinds of books, and I thought <coughs> I could write a romance, or a, you know, a science fiction a book, a romance, yeah, yeah there's all kinds of things I thought, and I thought, this was before the internet, and I thought, well, I know a lot about, I loved thrillers, I loved Ludlum and Forsyth and all these guys, and I, uh, and I thought, well, it'll make the research really easy if I do thrillers. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, you always be careful what you decide <laughs> when you go into a career. Do you have a question, sir? Uh, my question is the short answer on that. I wondered, coming into this and trying to meld, the, the, first of all, the challenges with the intelligence agency, because you've got kind of parallel streams. Right. Those not too too hard because of that. Because of that. Uh, yeah. Whereas Vince got into it and sort of did it backwards. I mean, he became a popular writer and then by through that was able to meet with all these people. Yeah, I started with yeah, it. So he uh, yeah, he had 
<coughs> his great story about <coughs> George, meeting George Bush, and Bush said, well, why don't you get in my car, and i got to go to this thing, and we'll drive you out there, and you can ride with me, and he was so excited, and then they got there, and they said, okay, you got to get out now, and left him by the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was a poor cell phone, so he's like, I had to, pay, you know, I had to get a pay phone, and find, like, get one of his brothers to come and pick him up. <laughs> if you had actually been an intelligent agent or an FBI agent yourself, then you have to go through a lot of hoops because you have signed you know, security and non-disclosure agreements and so forth. And so as the son of an FBI agent, I guess, that did that apply to you at all? No, did they ever no. come up to you and say, whoa? No, it's the, no not, not as the son, but it is hard. I have a, a friend who was the first female station chief. Uh, CIA station chief, and she's worked for a really good writer too. And boy, I mean, what she has to be, would have to go through because she wrote a novel, and I, I said, I don't want to read your novel. I want to read your you know, memoir. <laughs> <laughs> she said, oh, I'd take me, I'd be dead before I got through the lawyers on that. So uh, it, it's much easier. For me. Anybody else have a question? Yeah. Do you feel? I realize I'm asking it from my perspective as a reader, from the difference between survivor and order to kill. But I felt like order to kill, maybe you as a writer were identifying with Mitch a, a, a little bit more. I felt like there was, a, and like I realize it's just my perspective, but do you feel like there was a little, did you get a little bit more rap groove kind of going on in order to kill? <laughs> yeah. You just find just be a little bit more, like, it just seemed a lot more badass than he was in Survivor. And so it just was like, but okay, Survivor that's was that. weak. He was a little bit weaker so, in Survivor. I so I wasn't, and I don't know if it's just a storyline, and so I'm just curious if there was I, a, Yeah, I don't know that I would necessarily, I don't know if that would be my impression of that book at all. Um, but yes, is the answer. With Like I said, with the Survivor, I kind of wanted to create a forgery, so I was, I was really strict to carrying over the personality and everything from The Last Man. I made this off in a little bit from that, the last man. This one, like I said, I had to move forward. I had to make a decision to do that. And so you had, there's definitely elements of me. You know, his droopy dog opponent, uh, Grisha Azarov, the, the Russian, is not really probably a character that Vince ever would have written and put up against Mitch. Um, there's a little more humor in these books than Vince had, because I like that. I like to break the tension. And was, you know, Vince's books hated your finger even as a writer, not just as a reader, where I'm feeling that way when I you know, say something funny. So I feel it's a little more, a little freer, I think, to, to do that kind of stuff. So, yeah, interesting that you would say it more badass. I don't know that I would necessarily see it that way, but it's all, you know, so, you know if you write a, an interesting character that people like, hopefully everybody, it's just like meeting a person, everybody is a different impression. You're just you're just coming into the thing that is always the case, which is that every one of you here is going to read a different book. You're all going to read the book, but it's going to affect each of you differently because you bring yourself and your own history and personality and tastes and so forth to it. You know, it's like wine. Not everybody has the same talent, and it's also true in books. I think it's really fun for authors to come there and get reader reactions, though. You know, and I often see how surprised you or they are, you know, it's like, really? Did I say that? Or did you really take it that way? Or well, people who email me a lot, because I think they feel much freer in criticizing than they do Vince. And I, and I can kind of understand that, you know, Vince would just write back and be like, that was a killer Vince Flynn thriller, because I would know I'm Vince Flynn. <laughs> and I'd say that about my own books. Well, what are you talking about? I did exactly what I wanted to do in this column of um, This is a little more objective, though. Did you write a good Vince Flynn thriller? But the funny thing about it is, is you do, I, it, and it's, it's funny when it happens on the same day. Somebody sends you an email and says, you've ruined the series. You've made Mitch so weak. It's like a romance novel. And then, like, an hour later, somebody goes, you've turned him into a complete vicious thug. And it's, so, it's, and it's sort of, it, and, and it's not just them. It was me, too. I, I used to get, and on The Survivor, I got all these complaints about the swearing. You get a lot, but you're know, like, you know, Vince would have never said that, and he would have never used all the swearing. I saw some stats on that. 
Yeah, and I, so that when I pulled those up, well, and then the guy also really pissed me off because he's like, Brad Thor would never use language like this, and I sent I scored it to Brad, and he's like, like that guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so finally, I thought, I have these books. You know, they sent me the books in electronic form, so I searched them, and so Vince dropped the F bomb. 66 times in his last book, and I did six. Oh, wow. I was getting, so now I just, I get that, I just send it back to him to say, well. I want to pursue this. What, what are you talking about? There are statistics. Oh, Ryan, I didn't know it. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us now. Sorry? Who? Pretty much what he just said about yeah. the, uh, Vince having actually more swear words than. No, I know, but who's, who's, Compiling these statistics. No, it's Ryan. Yeah, probably. So Ryan Steck, right? He's the they call him the rapologist because he knows everything about these books, and I use him as a resource. Yeah, I credit him in there because like, oh, what happened? Remembers all of it. And actually, in my fight with his brother, I Ryan wrote like a three-page dissertation on how old Mitch is, and figured out within three months what his birth. I mean, there are charts and graphs. <laughs> so this guy's into it, and uh, yeah, any stat you need or any little detail from the books, that's your guy. I thought I was an expert. Was that in his week? Yeah. Well, he he has a, a website called Real Book Spy, which is good for it's great for just thrillers in general. Real Book Spy. He must be really underemployed. Oh, yeah, that's that, 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 he, that is his job now. Yeah. I really? Think. Yeah. Because he does, what does he get guys that makes his website pay and all? I'm so innocent. I don't well, bother with all that I stuff. Know, I, 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 I'm going to see him next week. I'm going to have to ask him. <laughs> well, isn't it? I think if you click through or something, is it what's that called? Affiliate marketing? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask him next week when I see him uh, how, what he's done with that. You could turn a hobby and an obsession into money making. No way. He has said, well, now you. Now I've turned my hobby into a job, and that's really different. So, but yeah, it's a great thing. Just about books, thriller novels in general. If you're interested in thrillers, it's a great resource for what's coming out. And, uh, so, what's fun. when you're not writing, which is probably what five minutes a year or something, uh, do you read anybody else? That's a question many of you always ask. Is, uh, you know, <laughs> not that much, actually, because of fun. keeping up. Well, you know, then all my stuff stacks up on research. So trying to keep up with world events and come up with ideas for the next threat and all that, I would say that is my primary focus. Um, so if you're not writing your research? Or skiing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of your creative process as, in, as far as coming up with the next? Well, with my own books, it was always to look at something in a different way. Uh, so I, I was always interested in you know, how could you solve the drug wars or, and, and, and I'm bringing that to this one a little bit in that people think of, like I was saying, people think of Russia as being this sort of resurgent country and it's really collapsing. So that's what I'm always looking for is what, what's an idea that everybody thinks one way about, but the truth may be something separate. Uh, and <coughs> with, it, it's, it's actually kind of prevalent now because people, I think, are watch so much news now with the 24-hour news cycle. They, there are all kinds of interesting misconceptions that kind of get built in, and uh, they're fun to explore. Did you win the argument? Uh, you can't. Uh, Tim, you can't win an argument with that guy. But no, I, he never got back to me on that. I sent him, I sent him the link, and I think he, he had to, you have to give up. With their charts and graphs. <laughs> <laughs> the problem, so the fundamental problem in that argument is, and Vince bracketed Mitch's age uh, with the fall of Pan Am 103, and he had never done that before, and it was right when he did it. But now time moves on, and you know now Mitch, if you take that one data point, has to realistically age. Which which Vince yeah. did, and yeah. I don't want he to. Was in college he was college when that happened. were not reading Spencer. He was originally a Korean War veteran, and then he's still an action guy in his middle age when Bob died in 2011. 
So or Jason know, Bourne fought yeah, Vietnam. Yeah, I mean, he's just kind of actually <laughs> Harry Bosch. <laughs> Harry Bosch, Book Nineteen, Next Tuesday, started out in the tunnels remember, mm -hmm. in Vietnam, yeah, yeah. And, and here we are. You know, he's actually probably almost mm -hmm. a great grandfather, but he's still working for the LAPD. Certainly, James Bond. Uh, actually, oh, no, yeah. I'm not working for the LAPD. I'm a line of He's working for the San Fernando PD and so forth. Anyone else have a question? Yeah. I try not to do it. He doesn't have to do titles anyway. Publishers do titles. I try. Yeah, I try, and then I they always shoot them down. I had a good one for this one. I can't even remember what it is now. It's a killer title. I already hated it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I've ever titled one of my books. Oh, but I try. I'm going to keep at it. Until yeah. it when, when you go back and you, you read um, the past Mitchell stuff. Did you feel like there were any, any maybe as a as a writer, you are identifying maybe some holes in the stories uh, at, at, from a, maybe a timeline thing that you had to go back and you just had to scratch that itch and uh, address that one because I because I had one that I was <laughs> suspecting of because you so early in the very first books. Vince, yeah, God, I was getting excited. It was, it was always my question. I was going to ask Vince. He was like, because he had rap as a world-renowned triathlete, winning Ironman. And then American Assassin came out. He was just, you know, just a lacrosse player. And and then in Survivor, there's one reference to he could go back to doing triathlons, but he wouldn't be as what he was. And so I was like, is that it? Is that? Did you have to close that loop for me? <laughs> I threw that one in there because I thought it'd be fun, and I'm a bike racer. Uh, so, but yeah, the the um, there was I will say, there was never any time for him to have done that. I, I mean, it was something that Vince said at some point. It said he ran, he won it twice, and so there was no there was never anywhere in the timeline for him to have done that, and. Um, yeah, and then there's one there's one whole book, and I can't remember which one it was, that he shows up to a group ride in Europe. And I like like I said, I'm a bike racer. <laughs> Let me tell you, he would have been recognized. Because he's trying to get out of the country under the radar. Well, the two time champion of, of uh the of, of the Iron Man does not go to a group ride in Europe and not get recognized. So I threw that in there, but it will never be mentioned again because that's one of the things in my head that I had to straighten out about the universe because there were a lot of inconsistencies <laughs> in the universe, and my universe has to be very, he didn't bother him, but mine has to be very well understood. And so, yeah, never, and you know, he was called the Iron Man, uh, his, uh, his hands were yeah, so uh, that's gone. But if you continue, you're actually passing on a slightly different universe. If you think about it, you know, the next guy up will have to decide whether to accept your changes or... Well, my changes, they straighten out. They're, they make all the little things that were kind of incongruous, they straighten everything out. So if, if the next guy should probably follow what I've done, then all the numbers add up. I've gotten... Ryan Steck to check me on all the things to make sure I got everything right, and now and then I killed the people I didn't understand, and I figured out how old they were or whatever, and now it's it's pretty solid. I hope you didn't take that as a suggestion that there would be another band, because obviously yeah. I think someday be, I think it'd be great if it were you for at least a while longer. Oh, well, me too. Me too. It'd be very nice. Uh, well, I want to thank you for coming. Yeah, for sharing the round of To your comment, let me say something because you know this doesn't come up all that often. You guys have given up an evening. Many of you have driven considerable distance to come here. We really appreciate. It. Some of you are here a lot, um, for, for which we really appreciate. I feel that we need to give you about an hour. You know, if you come in and sit down in this ten minutes, you know, what was the point you're coming? And here's the challenge: you can't really talk about the book per se very long because you want to go home and read it. You don't want us to sit here. We could do that. We could take you through the entire book and completely spoil it. Or God forbid I could do a reading. 
wanted to say is one of the reasons that I love coming to these uh, to these author signings and book talks is yeah you're right you can't talk about the book because most of us haven't read it yet and so when we hear about everything else that's going on in life whether it's a trip to France whether it's a cruise whether it's a train ride across China I mean it doesn't matter what we're talking about um, it's it's all fascinating stuff especially when authors that I'm used to reading and I think okay I know how their character thinks all right well now I know what Kyle Mills thinks about this or I know what Brad Taylor thinks about that it's 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 a whole new look at the world, the, you know, the make-believe world that we disappear into when we read, plus our, our real world. I love the stories. That's why I come. Yeah, I, I, I can't talk about the book for an hour, but I can listen to stories for Do you ten. Know there's actually yeah. a danger side to this, which I have occasionally seen, which is some authors are really not charming. Usually, we have events where, you know, which is they have you because it, you know, the truth is it will affect your reading. Won't it? Yeah, well, if yeah, you yeah, really take well. the author and dislike, you're just not going to, regardless of how much you like your book. So I always feel there's slight risk, you know, for those of you who come, and I try to mitigate that if I see the author like about to, you know, commit suicide or something. I try to head well, off. You don't necessarily get into writing to sit. They don't tell you about the sitting in front of the they don't. Movie. And actually, you're very good at this, but lots of authors are not. I started doing this, you know, I used to be a trial lawyer, so I'm, that's what I did, right? And it was like the third author event we did when I realized the author was paralyzed. He had absolutely no idea, you know, what to go, and, and he was going to be good for five or six minutes, and I thought, well, there's a solution to that. You know, here we go. Well, this is a, this is a really fun format, because normally, you know, last night I just stood up and spoke, and I think... Mm -hmm. It wasn't too bad for me. I mean, my background, I didn't have to do a lot of public speaking, but uh, I was sitting next to a woman at one once, and her hands were shaking, shaking so bad, I had to pour her water for her. I was like, you have a Pulitzer Prize for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> but boy, she, but you know, a writer, you know, she liked to sit in her room, and she was very good at it, and produce books. And then so your publisher says, no, go stand in front of 150 people. And, and, entertain the story, and, entertain and, them and the other thing is finally that now that we live stream, and some of you were new to the store may not know that, that we televised this. So you can go home and watch it all over again and you can share it with anybody that was unfortunate enough not to join us this evening. It's a much more interesting way. If you just sat there and read for the camera, I would just, you know, try to be horrible. Anyway, enough of that, but I just thought that it would be, I wanted to thank you for being such a responsive audience and really participating in this. I love it when some of your fans are so interested. You guys right here, and even Seth, this is what I really want to thank you for. You sat in the front row. <laughs> actually, on many you occasions, thought about just taking all the empty chairs and moving them to the back and forcing you people then to become the front row. We <laughs> have competition tonight because mm -hmm. Amy Goodman is down at ASU. Oh, really? It's a big, a big lecture. Next Tuesday, Jean Baez. 
I come with my childhood. I saw her at the first Monterey Jazz Festival when I was in Stanford. This this hat is doing a thing. So I have to I have to be here for Michael Connolly, but in my heart, I really like my hair. Yeah. I don't even know if she can sing anymore, you know? Well, the Michael Connolly is at Double Tree, right? It is. It's not here. No. No, but it's not very far, so if you get lost and forget, you can come there. Doors open at 6 and the bar is open. So. We don't need tickets for that, right? No. Okay. Now, it turned out that um, it's almost $2,000 by hosting the event off site, which we can't quite absorb, but the publisher decided to step up and say, well, we thought, well, we'll pay half and let them pay half and it'll all be good. So, thank you. Alrighty, um, here's what I'd like you all to do. Would you stand up and fold up your chairs and lean them against the wall so nobody gets hurt? And um, since Mitch is going to go over there to the little table for the red chair. Oh, you are you are our last our last image for the night. <laughs> and you talking about your face? Was 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 